Hello, this is Danny from CG Dreams. And this is part one of multiple videos to come on how to rig a bumblebee. Now your bumblebee may look slightly different to this one. And this is because the video tutorial that I created for um, making this bumblebee was for beginners and intermediate users of Cinema 4D. In fact, to modeling in general. But what I've done is I've just used exactly the same process as what I've shown you in that video tutorial, just to modify my bee to look a little bit more realistic. In either case, the rigging process is exactly the same, and you can also apply this to future projects for your insects. Before we start the rigging process, there's a few things that we need to check and make sure that we complete it. The first thing is we need to make sure that your model is 100% complete. There's nothing worse than having to go back and re-edit your model after you started doing the rigging. This can cause a number of problems and it can break your rig, losing you a lot of time and adding a lot of frustration. The next thing is to make sure that your mesh is optimised and checked. When I say optimize, I mean that we can select the mesh. We can then go to our mesh, remove, and then click on optimize. This will remove any floating uh, vertices that may be in the scene that are not used or not needed anymore. This can also um, solve some problems where there may be some uh, polygons that should be welded together and they're not. This is going to solve that problem as well. For the mesh checking, we can select our mesh and go to mode then go to the modeling and then here we've got mesh check-in if we turn this on you're going to see everything about your model if there's any real bad problems in there it's going to highlight them here and this is the time to fix those the next thing would be to make sure that your uvs are complete and done and they're optimized for the use that you want for your model if you want more texture quality high filtity textures for close-ups then you probably want to go and uh, down the UDIM route if you're okay with having a medium to large texture for one single UV space then you can just sort your UVs out in one space for me I've divided my model up into parts it's not necessary but I find this is a, a little bit easier when I'm doing my UVM process to export separate models you don't have to do this, but this is something that I've chosen to do. And I've used the UDIM process so that I can split my model into more detailed maps. The next thing is you need to make sure your model is in centered weld space as well as scaled correctly. You can see here that my model is centered to weld space. It's up axis, the Y axis is correct. The Z axis is in a negative Z pointing backwards um, away from the, uh, the front of the character or the B in this particular case. And the X axis is pointing to its left hand side. This is something that we want to make sure that we've got before we start to do our rigging process. Of course, this would also include scaling your project correctly because this can affect things like dynamics and lighting, certain lighting can actually be dramatically affected, especially when you're using something like subsurface scattering. So make sure that that's correctly done. The next thing is you want to make sure that your model is posed in a good neutral pose. You can see here that I've gone to the point of making sure that my wings are fully open so that I can easily access the wings and add the joints to them. You can see here that I haven't put any curvature in the abdomen area and I've only added curvature to areas that need to have a natural bend in its joints. So you can see here that I've actually put a slight bend into the legs um, and more of a bend in other joints than others so that when we do certain processes during the rigging process that it will automatically understand which way that it should bend in its natural um, orientation. This is something that we're going to um, explore a little bit deeper when we deal with inverse kinematics. The last thing to mention is, is that you just need to make sure that you really are happy with everything and that you've double checked everything and that 
you um, often use your freeze transforms. The freeze transforms is going to make sure that it keeps a record of where everything's located within the scene, its position and orientation and scale. And this is often done in your coordinates tab. You can see here when we select anything in here, including joints, controllers, and anything that we're going to use, you've got the ability to expand this freeze transform and then click on freeze all. And what this will do is it will keep a snapshot record of its position, its scale, and its orientation in the scene. Should you accidentally move something, you can easily reset that and put that back. And that's done in the reset transforms button here when we activate this. It's absolutely crucial that you keep organized during the rigging process. And one of the best ways to do this is to create layers. You can see here in the object manager, we've got this tab called layers. Normally it'd look like this when you've got the attributes selected. By going to the layers, I want you to create some layers as follows for controllers, meshes, joints, and poles. As we go through the process, you're gonna be wanting to hide and show different elements and keep these organized. You also see that we've got a folder, which is commonly called a null inside Cinema 4D. This is going to be used as a way to contain multiple objects into a null so that we've keeping these things organized. So the first thing I want you to do, if you haven't already done so, is to create a brand new null. And it's done by clicking on here. You want to select that null and you want to make sure that that null is going to be called meshes. Now I like to keep the nulls that I create centered to the main object of the scene. In other words, the thorax for me is the centered part of the object. And what I would normally do is I'll create a null based upon that pivot point. But it doesn't really matter because we're not really going to be doing any animation on this. This is just a preference of my own. So if I wanted my null to have this pivot point that matches that of the thorax, I will hold down the shift key while with the thorax selected and then click once on the null. That null will then be created as a child of the thorax containing that same pivot point position as you can see there. You can then drag that null out and then drag the entire lot of meshes inside that null and then that null will contain the same pivot point as the thorax. This is a little trick that you can use and you will be using during the rigging process when you want to match the pivot point of one object to another. In my particular case, you can see I've already created a folder called meshes and I've put all of my objects inside there. The next thing that you would want to do is make sure that you zeroed off everything. What I mean by this is you need to freeze the transforms on your object. This makes sure that you've always got a base level to go back to. If I was to select the head as an example and we expand our coordinates, you can see here that we've got minus 12.4462 on the Y. This is not its default location and position. So to make sure that it's its default location and position, so it's zeroed out, we're going to select everything holding down the shift key Alternatively, you can go to your folder, which says meshes, and middle mouse click, and that will select everything within inside it, all its children. Then what you can do is you can go back to your attributes, and inside the chords, short for coordinates, we're going to expand the freeze transforms and click on freeze all. Now when you select these individual objects, they should show as zero. Now what you're seeing here is the freeze transforms, but when you expand the coordinates for the object and select these, you can see down here, well, everything is zeroed off on the X, Y, and Z for both the position and the rotation. This is something that you're gonna be wanting to be doing a lot during the rigging process to make sure that you've always got something to go back to should you accidentally rotate or move a position of an object or a joint. The next thing after this is we're going to create a series of other folders or nulls so that we can keep things organized for a deeper structure. So we've already got one called meshes. I'm going to create another one called B. 
This is going to be for the main character. So I'm going to call this B. And I'm going to drag the meshes inside that. And then within here, I'm going to create another one. But this one's going to be called Root. Now, the Root is going to be our first controller that we're going to be using to move the entire character. In this particular case, our character is the B. So I don't always start with doing this, but in this particular case, because I'm taking you through a process, I'm going to start with this right now so we get that out of the way. Now, I'm going to be choosing to not use a null and I'll show you why. If I was to use a null as our root, I'm going to create one and call it root. And then I want to visually see what this looks like because this is going to be a visual controller that we select. I'm going to go to the objects. I'm going to change this to something like, I don't know, um, Let's find something, I don't know, something like that maybe, okay? And then we can expand the size of it. Now, if you're happy with this, then you can stick with this and you can actually use it. But if you want to create something a little bit more unique, you're going to be wanting to create a spline-based controller. Now, the problem with the null-based controllers is that you can see where its pivot point is. What you can't do is have the controller stay where it is and have its pivot point move to a different location. This is something that is going to be essential for later on when it comes to controllers. For that reason, I will only make a controller when that controller is not going to be visible, but it can still be used in a different way. But when the controller is going to be selectable, I will opt for going for one of these and even make my own as an example here. So I could select, I don't know, the same one. And it's the same shape, but this is a spline controller. The difference is, is when I make this editable, I can go in there into the points mode and I can start to manipulate this. I can cut it, splice it. I can even draw my own spline custom controller so as an example here when you've got a spline selected and you've got some points selected you can right click and you've got all of these tools available to you so i can chamfer the edge i can choose to add additional cuts in there as an example i can even go ahead and create my own one from scratch as i already mentioned and that's something that you may want to do In either case, you want to go ahead and make your root controller. We're going to call this root. And we're going to add this inside the B. Now, the other thing that I briefly touched on is the fact that with this type of controller, you are able to actually move its pivot point away from the visual selector of it. So as an example here, you can see the pivot point is right centered to it and it's right on the floor but if you was to go into the axis tool you can actually move this so you can have a pivot point at a different location to where the visual selector is and this is one really key feature of a spline controller that you're going to be needing but for us that's fine if we leave it there because we're going to be able to select this eventually and have the whole entire character move later on so spend some time, create your own root controller. You can um, look at other tutorials that are available where it teaches you how to use your spline tool, your spline pen, and you can create all sorts of things with that. You can also um, use a combination of, um, of your spline uh, shapes and use, as an example, the uh, spline mask where you can cut out shapes from other shapes. But I'm not going to go into that into that kind of depth in this particular tutorial. So when you've done this, come back and then we'll move on to the next step. Right away, I'm going to be selecting this root controller. I go to my layers and I'm going to assign this to one of my controllers, my layer controllers. OK, this means that we can now turn the visibility on and off of this. 
and we're going to do this as we go along. Now we're going to create a couple more. We're going to create within inside our root a null and I'm going to hold down the shift key and it's going to put that null inside the root. If we select this. Okay, and we're going to call this rig. Select that root again. And then we're going to call this one with the shift key master controller. I use CTRL short for controller. And I normally put a dash or an underscore in there. The rig that we're going to be creating will look like this. As you can see here that it's disjointed in some areas. As an example here you can see here that the thorax and the head with the antennas are actually all one part of one part of the um, anatomy. Whereas you can see here there's no bones in between this and the legs. Likewise there's no bones in between the mouth joints to the head. So these joints are going to have a connection of a hierarchy within them, but not necessarily within a hierarchy of joints. They just could be connected in different ways. So this is like a disconnected rig, where you can clearly see that some parts are disconnected from the other, like these wings as an example also. So let's look at some of the fundamental parts of this. I'm going to highlight and select them as we go. So this is going to be our root joint. This is going to be our thorax. The thorax is then going to be going into the head. Okay, as the child joint of the thorax. And then as a child of the head, we're going to be adding these antennae and all the different joints that are going to be needed to pose the antennae to be more flexible. So to start with, we're going to be creating just these two joints, which is going to be our root joints. Secondary to this, we're going to then start to create some joints that are going in the other direction, but starting from the same position as where our root joint was for the thorax. This is going to be for our abdomen. And as you can see here, we've got multiple joints that are going to be created for our abdomen. In essence, the abdomen is going to be going in the direction from left to right and the thorax is going to be in the going the direction from right to left depending on which way that you've got the model orientated of course in either case you can see here that they're going in opposite directions of course we've got the wings we've got the wings for the large wing and for the small wing and there's multiple joints for this so we've got the flexibility for the wings to flap and last but not least, we've got the legs. These legs are actually going to be obviously uh, lining up with the anatomy of the leg itself. And you can see here that we've got all of these leg parts here. We're going to be naming them appropriately as we go down through this. All the way down to the claw right at the very end. And exactly the same is for each of the legs. Now I spent some time working on the mouth area because I wanted it to be a bit more detailed. But even if you've got a simple basic model, say for instance, you've got the mandible, which is like its pinches to many, that is something that you may just be having in your mouth area. But I'm going to be going for the process so that you can see on a more in-depth, more anatomically correct anatomy how you would process this as well for the mouth. So as you can see here, the rig looks actually quite simple and it really is quite simple. The complexity is how we connect the rig together and how we get it to function together. And that's where things get a little bit more challenging as we go through the stages. But luckily for you, I've gone for those stages. I've come across the challenges and problems and I've solved them so that you don't have to go for those processes. The second part of the rig is the controllers. 
these controllers are going to be the things that we visually select on the screen and animate. These are the things that are actually going to be rotating or moving our joints. This way the joints can be invisible to us. We don't need to see the joints, but all we do need to see is just the mesh and these controllers. These controllers are made from splines. They're going to have different shapes and different functions. But when combined with the actual rig itself, you can see here that it will look something like this. We're going to have the um, joints. And then we're going to have the controllers. And this will make up the uh, total, what we will call a full rig. Before I start to add some joints for the forex and the head, I'm just going to show you a layout that I made up that's going to be useful for going for this process. So I don't have to keep on going backwards and forwards to the menu. Although I'm going to be doing this so that you can actually see where I'm getting these tools from. But later on, I will be migrating over to my own uh, particular layout. This layout is going to be available to you for free. So if you wanted to follow along and have a, a bit of an easier time when it comes to accessing these particular functions and tools, then you can just use that. But I'm going to show you where I'm going to get these tools from. So my layout is looking like this. It's nothing special, only the fact that I've got a lot of the tools I'm commonly going to be using. But I will be showing you where I'm going to be getting these from as I use them a good few times so you get to know where, they, where I'm actually getting them from. The first thing is, is the joint tool, and that's found from our character menu here. And you can see here the joint tool. I've docked that joint tool over to here. And we're going to select that. I'm going to hold down the control key and going to create the first joint in between the thorax and the abdomen. You can see right here. Okay. And then I'm going to click again and go right the way to the neck area. And then I'm going to click again to go to the end of the head like that. I'm staying in line roughly to where I'm going to be continuing on to make these antennas. But for now, that's all we need to do to add for this. We're going to rename these joints right away. Thorax. Press the down arrow key in your keyboard and you can go to the next joint and we're going to call this head. And then next, go down and call this head tip or head end. Just make sure you keep to the same name convention. So if you decide to have all your end joints called tips, you can do that. I'm going to call this end. And you should have this initial setup. What you really want to aim for is to try to get it in the center position of the thorax and lined up with the center position roughly of where the abdomen is. So what, I'm, what I can do with this is I can just select my translate tool there and I'll just move it down so it's roughly in line with the center of the abdomen. You can see there. So that's great. I'm gonna rename this root thorax. Okay, and I'm going to drag this into our rig folder. Okay, and that's what it should look like so far. I'm now going to select this null again go to our joint tool and this time I don't want to have a root null there not this time I'm going to enable this snapping you can find it up here and then in the options here we want access snapping there okay and then what should happen is is as you hover over the previous joint and click you should be able to feel it snap to there Now what we're aiming for is to aim halfway between the next part of your abdomen. So instead of going to the very end, we're going to go halfway between 
the next one so you can see here this is the end of this part of the abdomen section we're not going to do it there we're going to go halfway through and then go halfway through the next one and then continue doing that all the way through like that We're going to go to the first one that's unnamed. Abdomen. Under slash. Spine. And we're going to copy this. You don't have to type this in once. I'm going to hold down the shift key and select all of these joints here. I'm going to go to the basics tab. I'm going to just put one in. It doesn't matter what it is, as long as they're all named the same. Then I'm going to go to my naming tool. Now the naming tool can be found in your tools. There it is there. I've docked it over here. So we're going to go to my naming tool. This is something that I'm going to be using a lot. Expand the replace field here. And what we want in here is we want to replace one because that's what we've called all, all of our joints. And we're going to call this, I'm going to paste in what I've already put in there. Okay, let me see. Obviously didn't copy it, did I? Correctly. So it doesn't matter. So we're going to go and type in abdomen. Spine. And then we want to create an automatic number sequence. So what we do for this is I'm going to do another under slash. That's so, just so we can separate it visually seen. And we're going to have this dollar sign and a capital N like that. And we're going to click on replace name. And you can see here that we've got abdomen spine one, two, three, four, and five. We're going to be doing a lot of this. This naming tool is really, really essential for getting up to speed and making sure that we've um, got all of our joints named as we go along. It really, really is important. Now, because the abdomen here is actually a child of our thorax, we just close the thorax. What will happen is, is when we select that thorax and we move this, you can see here that only the thorax moves, only at this particular point in time, even though it's a child of the main null. This is because we created the abdomen separate from the thorax. We didn't have the um, thorax selected when we started it. So all we have to do is we just select our abdomen joints, middle mouse click, and drag and drop it into the thorax. Now when we select the thorax, you'll see that everything moves. But here's the thing, if we were to select the abdomen by itself and we can select the rotate tool, we're able to rotate this still. Okay, so you've got this secondary um, kind of control there. The thorax is the parent, the abdomen is the child to the parent. So this is how we're creating this connection. There are several ways in which we can add the joints to the legs and I'm going to show you a method in which converts a selection to the joints. This way we're going to be able to guarantee that the joints are going to be dead centre of each part of the legs anatomy. So to do this we will start with the left back leg and what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the legs and if there's anything else in the way like the thorax the abdomen etc I'm just going to hide that either by selecting that object or by selecting the object and selecting the geometry by double clicking in polygon mode and then going to our select and then hide selected that way we're going to be able to have full access to our legs now the way in which this works is we make a selection set with our loops 
and we want to select the loops that are the closest point into which um, we want the placement of the joint to be or in this particular case not just the placement where it starts but where it actually pivots from and you can see here when I hold down the shift key and double click I'm able to do just that so I'm just selecting the closest point in which I want these joints to be created and you don't have to be exact you can select it there as an example or you can even select it from the previous destination or, or location of the, uh, the joint part of the leg as long as it's between the two that's the main thing we're going to work our way all the way down selecting these loops with the shift key until we get to a point where we can move to the next step so that would do for there um, I think that would be a good spot we'll just keep on working our way down you can shift these about afterwards but if when you're making the legs of your uh, creature whatever it may be a bee an insect try your best to think about where you're going to create these loops as the articulation point in which the joints are going to be bending so I'm going to go for there and then when it comes to this part I'm going to select the beginning the middle and the end and I'm going to do exactly the same thing for these other parts of the claws so that's just select we want to make sure that it's the same on both sides like that and we go to the very last loop that's available to us at the end so we want to make sure that we do have enough there and I'm going to go for one in the middle as well now what's really important here is that you really take a look at what you're doing here and make that decisive decision to stick to this the same selection for all of your legs that's assuming that your legs are made to be all the same this is really important um, for the reasons that I'm going to show you in a minute we can speed up the process greatly if you can maintain this so the best way to maintain this to make sure that you can select this again as an example is to set a selection set so when you've done this and you're happy with the selection you can go to the select menu and click on store selection and then with that stored selection you want to make the, the point of naming it like joint position as an example and then you can easily recall this again another little tip is is I use a screen capture software called Snagit and if there's anything that I want to replicate or remember I just take a screenshot of it and put it onto my other monitor so for instance if I wanted to make sure that I remember all of the places that I put these loops then I can just orientate it like that just so that I can see all of them and then I can replicate that across all of the other legs so moving on to what we're going to actually do with the selection set is we're going to go to our character menu and go to the convert menu and then you'll see here we've got this selection to joints now this only works if you hold down the shift key so we're going to hold down the shift key click once and then you'll notice that you've got a ton of joints in here and these joints are not arranged in a hierarchical order because there was no order for it to replicate but if you was to do a, con a selection that was in a hierarchical order in the first place it would actually maintain that in other words you can actually convert other things into joints so if we go to the convert menu you can see here we can convert um, to just convert to joints selection to joints selection to nulls we've even got spline to joints and joints to spline so we've got some options in there and if any of these happen to be in a hierarchical sequence it will maintain it but this in this particular case wasn't and you also notice that we've got the pivot point 
locator that we can see here is very, very large. So the next thing we need to do is we need to select all of these joints. So the shift key to select all of them in between. And then we want to go down to our object tab there and inside the access custom, we're going to bring this down to an acceptable size because otherwise they're going to be absolutely huge. Now, the way in which we can get a smaller increment in, in steps, you can see here we're jumping in one centimeter steps. What we can do is we can hold down the Alt key and you can jump in 0.1 of a step, as you can see there. And this is going to be helpful for us when we're going to need it to be smaller. The next thing that we would need to do is we would need to hide the leg. It's much more easier if you hide the leg when you're doing this. So I'm going to select the legs, press the S key while hovering over the object manager and it will jump to that selection. Then I'm just going to hide it from the viewport. So we've got this series of um, joints here. Now these are joints, these are not bones until they're connected by a hierarchical sequence. So let's just expand this. So the first one is this one here and then the second one from that is that one. So you can see here, so we've got number four, and then joint number five. So we need to put joint five into four and that will create the bone between the two. Then we select the next one in line. This is six, we put six inside five. And then we carry on putting the next joint into the last joint. So the next one in this particular case is this one here. So we put that into the last joint that we're creating a hierarchy of. And this doesn't really take long if you're just getting on with it. Of course, I'm talking to you in this tutorial, so it's taking me a little bit longer. But in reality, it's not really too much of a, a problem when it comes to getting through and getting the job done. You can keep an eye on these joints as you're going through there to see what's going on. And we, we get to this kind of point here where we would look at what we do with the arrangement of the next lot of joints, these ones here. So this next arrangement of joints is going to require us to have a slightly different layer or, or workout in the way that which we um, create these. And I'll show you how this is done. So this, we only need these joints selected at the very end. This is where the claws are. The first thing I want to do is I want to go to the object for these joints and then bring down that size because it's way, way too big. In fact, I could probably go point, naught point, zero four or three and that would be more fitting for us to see exactly the order of these joints so we could do the same thing with the order of these joints first of all we're going to select this one here and that one next so 17 goes into 18 and then the next one down from that is there so 19 goes into 17 and then we've got this next row of three joints that one these ones here you see these so we do the same thing and that creates that for us next lot of joints and then we do exactly the same thing for the other side then we'll work from here and if you ever feel that you can't really see what the order is on here just switch back on the geometry and you'll soon better see where one is placed to the next so we've got that one there then we've got nine inside there and i can bet that 10 would be inside there okay and there you have it so now we've got all of these joints i'm just going to control click and select the first joint of all of these it would appear we've got an, ad an additional joint up here that we may have not connected which we have and this one would belong to the previous one there i'm betting so I'm going to drag this into there and that connects that up for us. Now this one here, this is the one that's going to be connecting to the rest of these joints. Okay, so this is, we could say a claw part. It doesn't really matter what you call this for now. We're just going to denote that this is an important joint, is the end of this structure. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to control click and click the first joint of each of these other joints 
and then drag and drop them into what we've called claw and then it will create all the additional joints needed within that hierarchy as you can see there so that's great that's what we need now it looks like we've got some order a little bit wrong through the middle here maybe i'm just going to go and check on that just to turn on my legs to see and you can see that the order was actually wrong it should have started the other way around you can see that the way that my geometry is flowing so i'm just going to go back in there again and just reorder this and it's kind of a good thing that these kind of things happen because it kind of gives you an idea of how you best deal with these so we got these three joints and they're just in the wrong order let's just pull these out for the moment so that's the top one that's the next one and then that's the next one you can see here it looks a little bit different and then we can just drag this back into the the claw that we've renamed it for the moment and there we go that's that part now the next part is also very very important and, and that's the joint alignment so just to give you a brief idea of this is the joint alignment is gonna tell cinema 4d in which way the joint is orientated in order for it to bend the right direction and in order for this to happen consistently we, we maintain a same joint orientation and what that joint orientation should be is that the blue handle here the z axis should be pointing always down the joint this means that it will automatically it should automatically push the y axis facing front ways and the z axis facing either to the left or the right depending on which side of the body you're working on it should always be that way and this is the way the joint alignment tool tries to set things up by default so we're going to be looking at that next first thing we can do to make sure we've got some kind of good joint alignment is to just select a joint and you can see here clearly that we haven't at the moment so what we can do is we can go to the very top of the hierarchy of the joints middle mouse click and select them all and then you'll notice that we've got some options inside here and you can see here it says z axis this is the correct axis it should be going down and all we have to do is click on a line and this should fix pretty much everything that we need but if it doesn't we've got a dedicated tool to fix that but let's just select a joint now and see what we've got so you can see here that this joint is indeed showing the z-axis going down for the middle here in fact it's doing it on all of these but we've got a little bit of discrepancy when it comes to the um, this axis here the axis of the y-axis this should be pointing up so this is something that we can fix with the joint align tool so to do this all i'm going to do is i'm going to select the first joint in the hierarchy there and i'm going to select the joint align tool now in my layout here we've got the joint align that's the tool there but this can be found in our character menu the joint align tool as well when we select this we've got some options here in order to get what we want and by default we've got this up axis as y now hopefully this will fix it i say hopefully because sometimes it actually doesn't but there's always an option there to force it to fix the problem so we'll just try this start to start with and what we're looking for is this green axis there to point the opposite direction we already know the z-axis is pointing down the joint which is great but we need the um the y-axis to be pointing forwards so that's just quick click that and see whether that aligns and you can see here it's not actually doing what i want it to do so that's not really what i want to be happening now we can manually spin this around i'll show you how we can manually spin this around we go on the axis tool and then we can go to the rotate tool and we can just rotate this around 180 degrees now you can see that this yellow sorry the green part of this handle is now pointing the correct direction and that's the way it should be and the reason why we only have to do this on this one here is because selecting the rest of them can actually copy the previous or its parent so what we can do is we can then select these and again use our joint align tool and then 
with this option here, align um, with previous and then children, it should align all the rest of them to mimic or copy what it's already got from the root joint, which is this one here. So now when we select this, you can see indeed it is actually aligned correctly. I select all the way down through here and it's aligned us exactly the way we need to be. Now you can see here that this one isn't aligned exactly that great. And even though the axis is correct, you can see here that it's kind of rotated itself off um, the position of where in which the legs are actually pointing. Now we can go in here and do the same thing. Go to the um, axis tool. We would have, have to hold down the number seven key when we rotate this so it doesn't rotate the children. That's one way of dealing with it. The other method is to use the joint align tool again, but this time do something slightly different. What we're gonna do is we're gonna select the top joint, which we know is already aligned perfectly. We're gonna create a null within this, hold down the shift key, which means it's gonna take on the same direction as that uh, first joint. The only difference with this is we're just gonna rotate it um, 80 or 90 degrees upwards, so it's facing up, holding down the shift key. So that's what we've got for the null. I'm just gonna move this out the way and forward. And this is gonna be something that we're gonna aim towards. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just turn on my legs and position this null so it's down the center point of our geometry. Because this is really what it's all about. It's about getting it centered to the geometry's axis. And this is a good way to tell it which direction our legs are actually pointing in. So I'm going to turn off my geometry, select the second joint onwards, okay, middle mouse click there to select all of them. We know the first joint's already aligned fine. We're going to go to our joint align tool and inside here we're going to choose aim. And we're going to drag that null into there and then click on the line. And then what that will do is it will line our joints to aim right down through the center of whatever our geometry is placed. Now, if we were to select these joints, we would see not only down is the Z axis pointing down the joint, but it's actually aligned with the Y axis down the center of our geometry. So you can see there. This means when we rotate these joints, our legs are actually rotate on the correct axis pivot point at the right location. I've now gone into a time lapse to do the exact thing with the next set of legs until we get all of the legs done following exactly the same procedure. So the next thing that we need to do is we need to select these joints, go down to the settings and the object for the joints. And you'll see here that I've clicked on bone for its um, axis size. I'm going to do that exactly the same for the other joints. Middle mouse clicking so that it gets rid of these large um, oversized axis joint points. 
and now they're reset. Now that we've done that we're going to start to use our naming tool and we're going to use some really good features of this tool that are going to be so helpful and saving us such a lot of time. What we need to do is need to make sure that we double check to use the full features of this naming tool that there's the same amount of joints in the same hierarchical order for each of the three legs. Of course, if you're going to be rigging an insect or something else which requires a different amount of joints, then some of this process you won't be able to do. But I want to show you this anyway, what we can do with the naming tool. So I'm going to go to my own custom setup here. The naming tool, which I've got here, is found over in the tools menu. That's where you're going to find this uh, naming tool from. It's a good idea that you decide your naming convention, the way that you want to name things. In particular, we're talking about the prefix or the prosfix. This is what's going to be at the beginning or the end of the naming. Normally at the beginning or the end, you're going to have something that denotes whether it's to the left side of the character or the right side. And what I use is I use a prefix, meaning it's on the left-hand side of the naming. So as an example here, I would say the left side would be L underscore and then it would be followed by the name. Now lucky for us we've got the naming tool and this is going to simplify a lot of this for us already. The first thing that I would do is I would select all of the joints that I'm going to be affecting. Um, so that's just middle of the mouse click on the top one here and it selects all the children. And then I'm going to go into the basic tab and then just rename the whole lot. So like one or five it doesn't really matter just so that all of the bones are actually named the same this is going to really speed up things for us now when you do your first leg what you're likely to do is rename everything individually because there may be different names for different parts of the leg so for instance we can have the coxa the trochanter the femur the tibia etc and the um, differences between the um, back leg, the middle leg and the front leg is that we've got to include some of that within the naming. And this is where the, um, the tool is going to help us. But for the first leg, even though I've gone ahead and renamed everything to one, this is just something to show you that of the way that I do things and the practice that I do things. Certainly for the second and the third leg, this really comes into its own. But for the first leg, I'm going to go down from the top all the way down to the bottom and manually name each of these bones because they are different. And we can, we can start with the front one, that's fine. So the first bone in our list is the coxa. We don't have to write anything in there other than the name. Now when we've done this, we can press the down arrow and we can continue to name our bones. So the trochanter, then we've got the femur, and we keep on going down, tibia, and then we've got the tarsus bones in a minute when we get down to the bottom this one's a funny name basitarus I think it says forgive me if I've not pronounced that correct Tarsus. I am quite familiar with the anatomical names of human bones, but some of these are new to me and some of these are not. Let's see, Tarsus for this one here. You can see where we are at the moment there. These ones here are. I'll just highlight these right now. 
these ones there are the tarsus bones. For these ones, I'm going to be using the name convention for Tarsus across all of these. Or what we can do is we can just select all of these bones that are the Tarsus bones. I think that takes us to around about there. One further back. Right. There we go. Because the other end bones here are the claws. Now let's go to the naming tool. Just going to delete anything I've already got in there. And we're going to replace one with Tarsis or Tarsi. And what we want on the end of this is we want a a postfix which is going to denote some numbers. And to do this, we use the dollar sign and then the capital N and I actually like to have at least a kind of a dash between that just to separate it off for easy viewing. So we're going to replace one with that name for the selected joints and we click on replace and then you'll see we've got this Tarsus 1, 0, 1, 2 and 3 and that's what it does for that. So that's all good. The next lot of bones see these here these are going to be claws middle mouse clicking with the shift key held down I'm going to keep it simple these are all going to be claws so that's just um, laying them claws okay all part of the same part if you wanted to be 100% accurate you could obviously go in there now this isn't obviously naming everything to its full degree. What we're missing is we're missing the prefix. We're also missing a part of this which is telling us what leg it is. So this is our left front leg. So what we do is we select the whole entire lot, go to our naming tool, and we don't want to replace anything in there. We want to add something. So we're going to go L underscore and this is going to be our front leg. You see what happened there? Now I'm going to back up a little bit. I'm going to do a little dash just after that. And now we've got the left front legs, front a leg, coxa, trochanter, femur, tibia, and you can see all the way down through to the end. So now this is denoting all of the name language that we need for each of these. Now one thing that is certainly missing from this is the the postfix of the numbering for some of these, um, particularly when we're talking about the claws here. So that's just select all of these we can go back to our naming tool there and we want clause so we don't need to add any more prefixes we can add a suffix so what i'm going to do is i'm going to do the dollar sign get that right and the capital n and i'm going to do a little dash just before it you can see here now it's given us this zero one two three all the way down through them and that concludes that. Now what we're going to do is we're going to create a preset out of this and to create the preset we're going to middle mouse click at the top the first bone the root bone to select all of its children. We're going to go to the naming tool and we're going to click on the add here and this is going to add a preset we're just going to call this leg. That's all we need to do. We're going to clear out this. Let's just close this down and we're now going to select the next hierarchical set of joints. I'm going to name them all one, like before. This is where it really comes into its own. And then we're going to go to our naming tool. 
and you see it says leg there we've got it already selected we click apply name and look what it's done it's actually named all of our joints for us all we now need to do is do a replace command so that's just copy this part anything which says left front leg go to our naming tool replace anything which is the left front leg we're going to call left mid leg right we make sure we've got everything selected in there when we do this and now it's renamed just that part of the naming left mid mid leg leg and it's gone all the way down same structure we did exactly the same for the last leg there and in fact you don't even have to rename things like that it's only handy to rename things like with number one when you're going to apply a, a set of uh, new names replacing replacing the number one but we're actually loading our presets this is saving us a lot of time so we just click on apply name to the whole lot and again it's the left front leg we want to replace and this time we want to just call it back back leg and click on replace name so now we've got all of these three legs now front left front leg left mid leg and left right leg or back leg shall I say left back leg and now we've got all of this name convention done for us and we can use this um, for other other times where we're going to have lots and lots of bones the other thing that you can obviously do when I when I just showed you here I'll just show you a new scene where we've got a load of bones We can select all of these and by naming them like one and going to our naming tool we can say replace everything that's one with say torso or, sp or spine spine we can do a dash a dollar sign and a capital n and now when we click on replace it's going to replace everything that's one with spine and a number going after it and it's going to be a capital n There we go. Spine one, two, three. You can see the advantages of um, using this tool. So when you've got a spine or something that's got a lot of numbers coming after it. Let's just close that down. Now we've named everything. We can now make sure that we select all of these joints. I'm just going to collapse them, but I'm going to middle mouse click on them with the shift key. I'm going to go to the coordinates and I'm going to go to freeze transforms and click freeze all. This means that if we accidentally move something we can reset our transforms back to where they were. And so as an example if I move that out the way like that we can just go to a reset our transforms. And I'll just show you where they are. Just click this you see reset transforms and providing we had set them correctly we would be able to reset them I don't think I've set them correctly that time just go back make sure we freeze all and then if anything gets moved out of place then we can revert it back to where it was originally by using that reset to transform and this is something that we are definitely going to be needing later on you can see here the effects of this this reset transform was put there to replace what we would use in previous versions of cinema 4d called reset psr but this is called reset transform so it's built into cinema 4d now if you like my content and have learned something from it please give a thumbs up and subscribe I'm not monetizing my content, it's for free, made for you in my own free time. So please give me some support back by hitting that thumbs up and subscribing.
The next part of this video tutorial will be up very very soon and we will continue where we left off. So stay tuned.